good song it comes all the way from the, from Ireland. Did you all know that? All right. God bless us. All right. I want to depart from what we've been looking at for the last six or seven weeks. We've been looking at the life and mind of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we saw those that hated him. You all remember? We saw the anointing of love. Then we saw the man that uh, gave him over to the Romans. Then we saw two, two messages concerning his trial of last week with Pilate and why Pilate ultimately gave up the Lord Jesus Christ to the Romans as the Jews wanted him to do. He was blackmailed into that. So I thought I'd take a little break from that before we get to the crucifixion and the cross and go back to a series that I began prior to this present one. Uh, who am I? Who am I? Who does God say I am is what we want to look at. So let's go to 2 Thessalonians this morning, and let's notice chapter number 2, all right? 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, please. And I would like to read verses 13 and 14 by way of text. Now here it says, and I'm reading this morning out of the ESV, says, but we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits, or chose you from the beginning to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he has called you through the gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's a wonderful statement, isn't it? A wonderful statement. You know, in the past, these two messages, who am I? I am what Yahweh says I am. And previously, we saw that we are accepted. Yahweh, or God, has accepted us. Second thing we looked at is that we were alive. We are alive. Now, I've come to a realization, and th th this has been with me for a while, but uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And I'm sure we all believe that. So when I read the scripture, I'm believing and reading something that God already believes because he gave it. And as Peter says, holy men of old moved and by the spirit, wrote these things down. So when I read our text here in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, verses 13 and 14, and I read, brothers beloved by the Lord, I have to believe that to the nth degree, that we are beloved by our Lord, if you please. And if anything in the world can get you excited and thrill your soul and overwhelm you, you ought to realize that in the eyes of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that's who he's talking about right here, you are beloved, say, you are beloved. Now, if I turn back to 1 Thessalonians, keep your finger here, though, please. 1 Thessalonians, in chapter number 1, and I read verse number 4, and notice this with me. For we know, brothers, loved by God. This is loved by the Father, that he had chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction, and et cetera, et cetera. So when I'm looking at this, and I think of this, our dear brother Bill in his universal version translates that, that you are the particular object of divine favor. Now when I read that, and understand that God believes that, I wonder why we don't believe that. We are beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are beloved of the Father. And as our brother Bill translates, we're the object of his divine favor. I mean, that's a tremendous truth. And you know the company that, that puts you in? Now, hang in here with me. Come to Ephesians chapter 1. Okay? Ephesians, please, chapter number 1. Ephesians 1 and verse number 6, where it says, To the praise of his glorious grace, 
with which he has blessed us in the beloved. God the Father has blessed us in the beloved, and who is the beloved in this case? Well, it's our Lord Jesus Christ, according to verse number five. Go up to verse number one. The Lord Jesus Christ is beloved, the beloved Son, the Son of his love, the Father's love, and 2 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians tell us what? We are also the beloved of God. And I think that's something we have to grab a hold of and, and, and just let it permeate your very heart and very mind. For I believe, folks, that our union with the Lord Jesus Christ not only means I am accepted and alive, but because I'm in him, I am now beloved of God. I don't know what better thing there can be in the world today. You say, Brother Dan, well, what's that mean? Well, let me give you four definitions of beloved here. Now, those of you who've been with us for 30, 35 years in our, in our building here, in our, our ministry here, will remember our, our beloved brother Scott, Don Scott. He was a pastor of the church that I was ordained in back in Jacksonville, Florida. But he came up one uh, summer with us for a week, and he, he taught us how to study. You remember that. He says, you read, research, reason, and record. And along with that, he encouraged us to purchase the 1828 American Dictionary of English, written by Mr. Webster. I don't know if some of you remember that or not. And I remember when we bought those, they were $12 a piece. And we must have ordered 30 or 40 of them for the folks that we had here. Now when you go to CBD, the Christian Book Distributor, you can get one for $55. So things have escalated, you see. But at any rate, Mr. Webster, in his 1828 dictionary, defines beloved as greatly loved and near to the heart. Near to the heart. Mr. Bullinger, in his critical lexicon, says, Preferred to one person out of many. Oh, now think about that. Preferred to one person out of many. Spiro Zodiades in his complete word study dictionary, the New Testament, says this. Finding one's joy in someone. Now he gives many definitions and they kind of agree with the first two I gave. But I picked this one out. Finding one's joy in someone. Talking about what does it mean to be beloved? And then Thayer, in his Greek-English lexicon, let me give you a testimony about Thayer's Greek-English lexicon. This is Haley and I uh, celebrated a wedding anniversary this past week. And this is what she got for her wedding anniversary. She got a Thayer's Greek-English lexicon. She wanted one. Of course, I got her some flowers along with that, you know. But I, I thought it was really good that my wife wanted a Thayer's Greek English lexicon. But here, uh, Mr. Thayer translates or gives us a definition of beloved as to have preference for, unwilling to abandon, or do without. So there we have four things. If we read those four things, we can say this, I am greatly loved by God, I am dear to his heart, God finds joy in me, he is unwilling to do without me. I mean, you think about these things, and uh, if there's anything in the world that discourages me as an individual, it's to find another individual has no self-worth. And I run into those kind of folks all the time, especially in my business and my, I'm traveling. And the young people, they just don't find the self-worth. Well, I'm here to say this. If you can't find self-worth in God because you are beloved, you're never going to find it anywhere. God loves us. In my Father's heart, and I'll say this and I'll say it unashamedly, the Father's heart is way beyond John 3.16 with us. And I realize he loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and praise God he did that. But what happens when you enter it into union with his son? Now you come to a place 
where you're greatly loved, you're dear to his heart, he finds his joy in us, and he's unwilling to do so without us. Now, I use the word us here to include us all, but in my notes, I put me. Because I am beloved by God, as you are. And you need to keep that in mind. So I'm going to ask you this. What does this mean? I mean, what does it mean to us? What does it mean to me? Now, come on back with me to 2 Thessalonians. And let's go through the words we find in verses 13 and 14. Okay? Let's go through these words. And I'd like to compare them with some verses in 1 Thessalonians. And what I'm going to do is use Jonathan Mitchell's New Testament. And I don't know if you're familiar with this or not, but it's one of those expanded New Testament. And Jonathan Mitchell uses as many words as he can to describe a Greek word uh, into the English. But on the front it says, God's message of goodness ease and well-being, which brings God's gift of his spirit, his life, his grace, his power, his fairness, and his peace, and his love. So then it says, expanded, amplified, multiple renderings is what we have. And what I'd like to do is go through chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians, verses 13 and 14 here, and compare what we, we see and add to it a little bit. To see just what God is, is trying to get across to us. You know, when I was in Bible school, I had a Dr. Davis. He was the head of the school, but he also taught Paul's epistles. And when we got the, Thess the Thessalonica books, he said, and, and this is standard because I, I found it in commentaries, that Thessalonica, the church there, was it's called the model church. In other words, there weren't any problems here, but there were worries about those that have gone on, already died, think, things like that. But there weren't any moral issues, actually, not too many things. So when we read these uh, verses that we're about to read, it's really going to magnify what it means to be beloved of the Lord. And that's actually what I want to do with you here this morning. So when we notice 2.13, it says, but we ought, we ought also to give thanks and if I turn back to, actually, <clears throat> we'll stay in 2 Thessalonians here for a moment. Chapter number 1, okay, and notice verse number 3 with me. Chapter 1, verse 3 of 2 Thessalonians says, We continue being indebted to be constantly expressing gratitude to God. Now, in our text, it says, but we ought always to give thanks to God for you. And so you see how he's expanded that thought? We continue being indebted. There's something within us as believers that made, make us indebted to each other to give thanks to God. And, and, he, and, and uh, Jonathan says, expressing gratitude to God. And how is it done? Constantly, say Constantly. Now, that's something for us to think about. We are what? Beloved, because that's what this is going to lead into. And so as the beloved sons of God, we're constantly or should be constantly expressing gratitude to God because we're indebted, see? Indebted to whom? That's the question. To our great God for all that he has done for us, you see. When I come over to chapter number uh, two, again, of Second Thessalonians. It uses the word beloved. Now I come back to First Thessalonians in chapter number one. And notice with me, please, <clears throat> verse number four. Here it says, brothers, and then in parentheses, fellow believers, and then my family, close parentheses. So brothers, Folks, having been and still being loved by God, knowing and perceiving your election, being loved by God, that's the whole point here. Beloved means you're loved by God. Say, loved by God. I come back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 
Notice verse 13 one more time. We're here. <clears throat> All right. Uh, let me read the whole thing. But we ought always to be giving, to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved, by the Lord, because God hath chosen you from the beginning to be saved or to be delivered, you say. Now I come back to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, please. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. And in chapter number 5, I'm reading verses 8 and 9 from Mr. Mitchell. We, on the other hand, being of day, open parentheses, belonging to and having characteristics of the day, having the day as our source, close parentheses. So we, on the other hand, being of the day, can and should continuously be sober, clear-headed, putting on or clothing ourselves with, enveloping ourselves in, entering within a breastplate of faith and love, which is and is composed of faith and love, which equals having trust and love as a body armor, and a helmet and expectation, okay? Expectation or expected hope of deliverance, health and wholeness, rescue and salvation, restoration to our original state. Verse number nine, because God himself did not place or set us into anger, inherent fervor, violent emotion, wrath or teeming, passionate desires, but rather into an encompassing of deliverance. Everything God has done for us, folks, is to deliver us. As Paul writes in another place from this present evil world, the attitudes of this present evil world. Think about what's going on today in our country alone and the attitudes people have. We need to be way above that. Say, way above it. Why? Because that was the work of the deliverance that Jesus Christ brought to us. Say, according to 2 Thessalonians here and chapter 2 and verse number 13. So then I come back again to verse 13, where it says, because God chose you as, or from the beginning, uh, to be delivered through sanctification by the Spirit. Through sanctification by the Spirit. Now this is a good one. Come over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, please. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. Okay, 1 Thessalonians 4. And let's notice, please, verses 3 and 7. I'll be with you in a moment. Here it is. Here is written, you see, this is the will, the intent or purpose of God. Your state being set apart from the common use or condition, you are to continuously hold yourself from all of the prostitution. Whoa, all of the prostitution. Figuratively, Mr. Uh, Mitchell says, the worship of idols or false religions and the break from covenants. Then I read verse seven. For God did not call us on the basis of an uncleanness, nor does he invite us to be on a path lived in, a soiled condition or a dirty environment, but rather within the sphere or set apartness say, the sacred difference in a manner commensurate to the covenant living. And so all this work that Jesus has done is given to set us apart from the rest of the world. The attitudes of the rest of the world, say, and the actions of the rest of the world. But that brings me then back again to 2 Thessalonians in chapter 2 and verse 13 to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Belief in the truth. Notice something, please, verse chapter number one of 2 Thessalonians. Please. Chapter one, verses three and four. Now we've read some of this before. We continue 
being indebted to be constantly expressing gratitude to God, always concerning you, brothers, according as it is continually valuable, because your faith, your faith, your trust, your loyalty toward God, okay, your faith is constantly flourishing. It's growing above, he says, ever growing, exceedingly increasing, and the love of each one of you all continuously unto the midst of each other, so that we ourselves boast in you folks among God's summoned ones, his, his called ones, if, if, if you please, over your steadfast remaining under to give support, persistent, patient endurance, and faith within all your pursuits and the pressures which you habitually have again, the pressures of life, in other words, are overcome by the truth and your continued faith in it. That's what he's looking at. Say, what's all this mean, Brother Dan? You're beloved. Can you grab that? You are beloved of the truth. Say, of the truth. Slide down with that, that thought with me to uh, uh, verses 10 and 12 of 2 Thessalonians chapter, chapter number 2. 10 and 12 here, all right? 10 and 12. 2 Thessalonians chapter 10, or chapter 2, verse 10. And with every deception of injustice or repeatedly being lost, in return for which, now I'm skipping the middle parts, they do not take unto themselves and welcome, welcomely receive the love of and from the truth. In other words, truth love is out there. It's being given out every day by believers all over the earth. But what happens with these people? They can't receive it or won't receive it. It says, and into the situation or into the point to be suddenly delivered, to bring wholeness to people. There's something about the truth that brings belief, say, that has to do with our being beloved. God wants us to share in that with other folks. Now, let me move on. I have four more points to look at here. Let's go to verse 14 of chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians. To this he called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we've been invited. <laughs> if we go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, watch what we have here. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, please. Notice verse number 24, where it says, The one, capital O, continuously calling you is faithful. He's trustworthy. He's loyal. He's full of faith and trust. Who will also perform. He will do. He will make. He will form. He will construct. He will create. He will produce. He's the one calling us. Paul says, work out your own salvation. Well, where did that salvation come from? Where is it? It's within us. God has given it to us, say, and I think that's what he's saying here, and, and, and God is calling us to be faithful because we are beloved, if that makes sense to you. Then I come back to 2.14 again in 2 Thessalonians, where he talks about a view to obtaining, and so we're in chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians. Notice with me, please, verse number 9, obtaining something. Chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians, because God himself did not place or set us into anger, we already read this, but rather into an encompassing of deliverance through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's bringing us somewhere. He wants us to obtain something that has to do with our Lord Jesus Christ. So finally, as we look at, I, I shouldn't say finally, we look at 2.14, it talks about glory there. Glory. Now this is something that's beyond me, but so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? The glory. And I come over to 1 Thessalonians 
and chapter number two, and I'm going to read out of the ESV for this. First Thessalonians chapter number two, and let's notice please verse number 12. We exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Seems to me that I've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son, which in my mind has to be part of the kingdom of God. I believe it's already here, and that you and I are walking in it and manifesting the very person and love of God and of our Savior Jesus Christ to other people as we walk in the world. The problem with most Christians is this, the world's getting worse in their perception. But let's face it, you read history, you know it's always been bad. And our problem is, well, yeah, the worse it gets, the closer we are to the coming of the Lord. I don't believe that at all. I believe that, believe that you and I have an obligation to walk worthy of the Lord and manifest him wherever we are and whatever we're doing in life, you see. So finally we see it's the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we find that in chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians and actually chapter 1 of 2 Thessalonians. So I, I'll read 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the center of all that we are, is he not? Yes. He's the beloved of the Father. We're the beloved of him and of the Father. Now, I want to read you a paraphrase to close this out. This is more of a devotion, I would say, than a, than a real preaching message. But uh, a gentleman I enjoy reading named Heckerson, Heckerson, uh, and his theology is Reformed theology. I have all his New Testament uh, commentaries. I've had them for 25 years. He says this concerning 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. I'll read this slowly. He says, we, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, who wrote the book, cannot do otherwise than ceaselessly thank God for you, brothers in the faith, who are the object of God's special love. Isn't that what we see? The love of God. Because in his sovereign, immutable election, God, from the beginning, chose you to salvation, which is, on the negative side, to rescue you from guilt, pollution, and punishment of sin. On the positive side, the entrance into the inheritance reserved for God's children, a salvation which becomes your possession through the work of the Holy Spirit, that is, through sanctification, a process of causing you to become increasingly detached from the world and attached to Christ until his image is completely formed in you. And through your active, vital consent to the body of redemptive truth revealed in Christ, to which final and complete salvation God also called you, having effectively applied to you, or to your hearts, the gospel which we preach to you, and which we urged you to accept in order that you might one day share the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we used to sing a day, uh, sing a song, what a day that will be. We haven't sung that in a while. What a day that will be. John writes in his epistles, and when we see him, we'll be like him. And that's coming, but it's all because I am beloved, and so are you. Beloved of our Lord, beloved of our great God and Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Keep that in mind. I hope it keeps in you for a while. Never let it out of your mind. You are beloved. All right?
God bless you. Let's sing again, Carl.